So my work has looked at nursery schools in England and in the work we argue that they operate in a hostile policy context but they have a really key role to play in reducing the effects of socio-economic disadvantage. So just briefly, what are nursery schools? They're part of a very complex and mixed sector. They are state-funded schools and they cater specifically for children who are aged three to four. At present, nursery schools are in decline. A third have closed since 1980 and just 389 of these nursery schools remained open in 2020. In 2015, early education argued many face continual uncertainty as to their future. They have severe strains on their budgets and this creates all kinds of issues around longer term planning. Nursery schools provide 4% of the free provision for three to four year olds in England, but they support higher than average numbers of children with additional needs. Nearly two thirds of the 389 nursery schools that remain are located in the 30% most deprived areas of the country. But in terms of Ofsted inspections, which is the judgment that's used to rate these settings, they are rated consistently as the highest part of the sector. So they always come out as good or outstanding. And they employ qualified teachers as well as nursery nurses and other practitioners. And they're led by a head teacher, which is in real contrast to other settings for this kind of age cohort. So as I said, it's a really complex policy context. Early Years has been a source of interest for governments under things like the Early Intervention Agenda of the Coalition and Conservative Governments. I think it's fair to say that in England and internationally, policy relating to Early Years education and care has been driven by three key rationales. So the first is children's development and educational outcomes. The second is facilitating parental employment. And the third is a social justice aim, which is reducing the impact of socio-economic disadvantage. The commitment to these three rationales has fluctuated over the last five to ten years, and it's this incoherence that we see throughout 2010, 2020, that has contributed to this hostile policy context. So it's a mixed picture, and as soon as we get a new government, and you will have all have seen that Liz Truss is now planning reforms to the early years sector within a few short weeks of coming into government, we always see this kind of pressure. So our research, we did these interviews with 17 participants across four nursery schools, all in areas that are rated as disadvantaged. They all did very well, they got good or outstanding. And we use this idea of policy sociology, especially the idea of policy actors, as a way of theorising and making sense of our data, what was happening on the ground. So, nice picture of a car there. Policy actors, you get narrators. Their policy work is around interpretation, selection and enforcement of meanings. And this is always done by head teachers or senior leadership teams. We get critics, like me, who will be part of a counter discourse. Receivers, they're very much more vulnerable with their policy work distinguished by coping, defending and dependence. So the analysis that we did is guided by the idea that policy is a process. And the staff we talked to experienced the direct and indirect impacts of this influence on the policies that they were taking on and engaging with. And that positions them in different ways as policy actors at different moments in time. So I've just got a couple of key themes from the data that I'm going to very quickly go through with you. So we think it's a hostile education policy context. In terms of budget, nursery staff told us policy had been reduced and it had made their financial situation far less certain. Nursery school head teachers are responsible for their own budgets but they face additional pressures to primary schools because they don't benefit from the same kind of economies of scale. We see in the quotes here how staff work as policy narrators, where narratives are both retrospective and prospective, and work to hold things together and try and move things along, and construct historical continuities or dramatic breaks with the past. At times, the teachers are critics. They're challenging things like reduced budgets and impacts on children with their concerns intertwined with the narration of a particular story of policy neglect. 
And in terms of the 15 to 30 hours policy, this was a big policy in this country. It was about providing free care for all children, regardless of their circumstances. And our participants identified several elements of the policy that were problematic. So Linda said it's very difficult to manage because of the uncertainty over child numbers. So if you don't have a child registered by the census date, you'll lose the funding for them. If children are coming in late, it's harder to secure the funding. But the, the narratives were not all negative. Staff welcomed the provision of free hours as it enabled many children to attend nursery school. And they were so enthusiastic in providing all kinds of specialist care for the children, particularly those who were disadvantaged and vulnerable through things like SEN. Practical problems with the funding system and what it meant for patterns of attendance meant that there was a sense in this case policy something that was done to nursery schools. So they were very much policy receivers. And staff retention was a real issue. So it was clear that the changing discourses around qualifications in the early years. So do you need a qualified teacher? Do you want people to have an MVQ qualification? What do we need? What's suitable? leaves them in a position where they felt they needed to fight for the recognition of the value of qualified staff. And by the way, this puts us far behind other European countries who are well ahead in terms of qualified staff for the very youngest of our children. So it was an example of feeling subject to policy rather than being able to ap appreciate it and being appropriate to the context. The wider context of austerity, and we did this research in 2019 and 2020, so this has only got worse in the last couple of years. As well as being affected by education policy, nursery school staff experience the impact of wider social and fiscal policies. So we know, don't we, the dramatic reduction in public funding from the Conservative-led governments from 2010 onwards. They were dominated by these policies of austerity. And this led to changes in the benefit system, which resulted in alarming reductions in incomes for families. And, as Tucker argues, will damage the life chances of hundreds of thousands of children growing up in this country under austerity. The impact of these policies was felt. So we had reduced support for speech and language therapy. But the most dramatic was the issue around social circumstances. So we describe nursery schools as a frontline service. We had staff who were helping parents fill in benefit claim forms, who were providing clothes for children, who were providing food parcels. It was really that bad actually on the ground, the, the hidden story of poverty, if you like. But we want to emphasise how nursery school teachers were agentic in their reactions to policy, as well as being subjected to all these really difficult pressures. They're not victims of policy. They're not just fearful about the future. But they, they were able to maintain a sense of professional pride about the quality of the provision they were providing. And we think this is linked to their status as specialist early years teachers and leaders. They had professional confidence to question the impact of policy, which was evident in the descriptions of the unique nature of these nursery schools as specialist providers. So you've got Gail and Sasha basically saying, you know, it's not just physical resources, it's our staff. And it does really make a difference when you have that qualified expert within the setting. And our participants were really passionate about the benefits of their provision and the learning that resulted from having early years specific resources and highly trained staff. This story of nursery schools as high quality providers is re very much reinforced by the research evidence. So nursery school teachers had a lot of agency and although there were all these pressures on nursery schools and reductions in what they were able to provide, there was such a commitment to social justice in combating the effects of poverty, often justified on moral grounds, so our participants would say it's just the right thing to do. This focus on the child is indicative of the power of an early years ethos where each child is unique and valued as an individual. It was all about reducing that social stigma that so many of them felt was a real issue. So Andrew said, it's about always keeping the child at the centre, front and centre of everything we do. And Mary said it's to really make sure the children aren't disadvantaged and left behind. We're doing everything we can to support the families. It's supporting the families, really. It's not just about the children. 
It's significant that despite the hostile policy environment described above, they're so committed to reducing the impact of dis disadvantage, and they took opportunities to do so whenever they could. As policy actors, they maintained a great deal of agency, railing and rallying against the system which presented many challenges. And they also displayed a great deal of positivity and passion for the nursery school sector, despite the fact that we can see, in longer term, it's in decline. And I would argue that 10 to 15 years from now, these schools, which are the jewel of the crown, according to um, Powell, who's an MP, won't be around anymore. And there will be so many more children who will be not getting that high quality care. So just some conclusions that we made. You know, I really want to emphasize the agency. They had a strong belief in the unique quality of the nursery school education, and they did everything they could to support the children. And it helps us understand the complexities of enacting policy in the early years, providing examples of policy actors operating in this hostile environment and how it interrelates with feelings of professionalism and a commitment to social judgment. And on the back of this piece of research, we used our findings to argue powerfully for the need to extend the uptake of the 15 to 30 hours provision that we already have. We have this policy, but for those most disadvantaged two-year-olds, their families are still reluctant to send them into these settings. And we argue that actually it's that push that we need to take forward to ensure that they get there. We know that when we actually work with children at a very young age who are really experienced kind of social deprivation, that we can make a massive difference to their lives. So we're now scaling up. This was just a £5,000 pilot study project that we did. We've scaled it up and we've actually put in, um, putting together an application that will go to the Nuffield Foundation to support their aims to reduce the effects and impacts of disadvantage. And as I say, we're in such a, a hostile policy context that's framed by austerity now that we really think it's time for change. Thank you. Mm -hmm.